still starting off, whether you're still starting off in your career or otherwise, financial literacy is a topic for everyone. Our guest speakers today are Melissa Blankenship and Radha Jerful, who are both volunteers at High Water Women's Organization, an organization centered on providing marginalized demographics with empowering financial content. We'll drop the, those links in the chat too if you'd like to learn more about our partner organization for today's event. Melissa Blankenship is the head of Institutional Foreign Exchange and Commodities Sales at BNP Paribas. For the past four years, Melissa has been focused on growing the US client franchise through prospecting, increasing wallet share and uncovering new revenue streams with existing clients. Melissa graduated from the NYU Stern School of Business with a Bachelor's of Science in Finance and International Business. Radha Jerful, who is actually a treasurer on the board of the CAAA, graduated from Barnard College in 2019 with a bachelor's degree in math and statistics. Currently, Rada is a foreign exchange algorithmic trader at BNP Paribas in New York City. We're excited to have everyone join us today and we hope to spare a little time in the end for a Q&A session. And with that, I'll give the floor to our speakers. Hi everybody, I'm Eleanor Brand and I'm with the High Water Women Foundation. I attended Cornell University and I have been working in nonprofits for my entire career. And High Water Women is my most recent job. I've had numerous other jobs in other uh, nonprofits over time. And High Water Women, in addition to providing financial literacy throughout the city to low income communities, uh, we, we provide programs to everybody from high school students through um, to adults. We, we've got programs that, that serve um, women who've gone back to college, um, women who have been homeless, all, all different areas and across all different parts of life. Uh, in addition to students like yourselves, or alumni like yourselves. So it's, um, it's a wide, wide range. We also have a small backpack program and we do a lot of sessions on impact investing. So if you have interest in the impact investing world, you should check out our website and learn more about what we offer there. Um, so for our financial literacy program, we do use volunteers, as was mentioned. We provide training and a curriculum. And Mel uh, started it off uh, several years ago. She's been a participant for quite a while and Gata is more recent um, and has just started her volunteer time with us. And we're very excited to have both of them and to be here. So Mel, over to you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Eleanor, so much. Uh, we're happy to have this event here. Just a disclaimer to get this started, this event is not for an investment advice. Just mm -hmm. to put it out there, this is more to show you the tools on personal financing habits and to know what is out there for you to educate yourselves. There's an abundance of information. It could be overwhelming. And we would love to set this as a stepping stone, as a foundation for you to even go above and beyond and learn on yourself on your own. So I believe Mel would like to share a personal anecdote um, to, which will relate to most of you and especially in the current uh, world order currently in, in, the, in the current um, economic situation we're living nowadays. Um, Mel, I'll pass it off to you. Yeah, I, I, I was sharing with the ladies yesterday actually um, how I even got into, how I found Thai Water Women and how, why one of the reasons I'm so passionate about uh, talking about financial literacy. I talk about it with my cousins. I talk about it with my sisters, with my friends, anyone who will give me the chance to talk about it. And really it all comes back to, um, I had just graduated college. I'd been working maybe about a year, a year and a half, um, was just recently married, was expecting my first son. And I remember talking to, turning to my husband and saying, okay, so what are we doing? Like, are we opening up a 529? Like how much percentage of our salary should we be putting to, towards a 401k? What does emergency savings look like? And he looked at me and said, 
you went to school for finance. Why are you asking me these questions and asking me to make these final decisions? I'm a history major. Like you should know the answers to these. And my two kind of, you know, uh, that the two thoughts I had at that aha moment was one, I don't know why I was turning to my husband to make these final decisions. Like I definitely was much more qualified given my background in schooling to make those final decisions for our family. Um, but two, really, even as a finance major, I took classes on finance in terms of, you know, balance sheet and accounting and investment banking. I didn't take any classes in college that talked about my own personal finances. And it's a whole other subject matter that unless you, you know, are blessed with having, you know, family members that want to talk about it or friends where it's, you know, kind of open and discussed as well, it's not something you just organically or innately know. You really have to educate yourself on it and it takes time. Um, so, you know, went to the books and started studying myself and was very, um, very fortunate to be introduced to high water women through one of my other coworkers, who is actually one of my bosses back when I worked at RBS. And I just fell in love with the program because it was everything I needed at that time to, um, you know, wish, that I wish I had back at that time to educate myself. And it really just, um, I think it's simple practices and good, you know, if you will, um, if I can steal the term life hacks in terms to take you through and, it's making those right decisions, having your money working for yourself. So then down the line, you are affording yourself and creating more opportunities for you, for your family, for your friends. Um, and yeah, I hope we hope to leave you with just some good little tools that you can hopefully apply to your day to day. And maybe some of the material will not be applicable to your current situation right now, but in one year or in two years, it might be. Um, so we hope that we leave you with um, just a couple of those uh, ideas that you'll be able to use in the future. So with that, maybe we jump into the content. Okay. Um, uh, Jenna, can you start uh, sharing the slides? And we will go start with slide three. I believe everyone received this. If you have not, please check the email that was sent today from the Arab alumni. Um, you can find the presentation. You can keep the material for yourself to go back to it later on. Um, I think Jenna's still um, page three. Um, in the meantime, I would like to ask- Jenna, how you, can't, you can't see the, the screen? Uh, I see it stuck on the first slide. Oh, sorry. I thought that was the third slide. And for those who did not receive the slides, we will ensure to um, send it to you after the event. If we did not within this week, please email us. Mm -hmm. this, the, uh, this is slide three. Is this where you're looking to start? <laughs> no. Am I Let, seeing you, just tell me where to stop. <laughs> okay. I just stuck on the openings, like the like the right. opening. It's not on a presentation form right now. Oh, okay. All right, hang on. Mm -hmm. We are seeing different things here. No worries. And maybe some context too. So, in terms of the material that we're going to be going through today, everyone, um, you know, High Water Woman has a. Um, many, many slides and a ton of content that covers a variety of different financial topics. Um, so this is really just one snippet that we thought um, just given you know the audience would be applicable to the conversation and to what you might be discussing um, or thinking about for yourself. So today we're gonna focus on saving and investing, um, but there is uh, some fantastic information outside of that, including taxes. Yep, that's perfect. Um, and Sorry other, you know, buy, buying a home. Um, so there's there's definitely a lot of other other subjects that we could be covering here, but we really wanted to focus on, um, which um, I think is just some really good um, good pillars, you know, to kind of start off with when you're just graduated school um, and are thinking about, you know, your next steps um, in, uh, right. in setting yourself up financially successfully. Mm -hmm. So Jenna, can you move to slide three? 
There we go, uh, Mel. Uh, before actually beforehand, um, quick show of hands, but you can also yeah. type in the chat box. How many of you have experience with investing or are well versed in your investments? I guess the poll simply says, "I have experience in investing or not." Um, Jenna, I'm not sure if the workarounds will have to see the statistics afterwards. But... <laughs> uh, we're, we're getting close. We have almost everybody's participated so far. Thank okay. You, All right. All right. So we have 29% of people have sort of experience, have an and experience 24% here don't and 47 and a half somewhat. So I think Mel, yeah. we will dedicate half, half of a, a focus yeah. today. Um, we'll talk. Yeah, you can take the floor. That sounds good. Um, okay, so what are we talking about today? Savings and investing. And why this slide says savings versus investing is at the end of the day, when you come upon money, be it if it's from your hard-earned uh, uh, hard uh, work, or if it's maybe a gift that you got from somebody, or just very blessed to have all of a sudden come upon some new money into your checking account, what are you doing with those funds? Hopefully your first thought is not going straight to the mall to spend it. Instead, your first really thought should be, okay, what am I going to be proactively doing with my money? And the two choices that we wanted to discuss today is saving your money versus actively investing it. So uh, some of these terms might be, you know, terms that you are well acquainted with. So I don't want to talk about, you know, the definitions of these ad nauseum, but just, I'm just going to say, you know, I'm just going to take the assumption that these might, uh, might be new terms to some people. So we will just walk through what each of these mean. So savings, what is savings? Savings is taking your money and putting it to the side and putting it in, if you want to call it, um, uh, you know, there's a couple of different ways to think about it. It could be your emergency savings fund, right? But it's money that you're putting to the side in order to save for your quote unquote rainy day. Um, also too, when I'm thinking of savings, I'm thinking of it as cash that you are putting into an account that's going to be easily accessible. So it's going to be money that you're going to in the off chance that you do need to tap those funds, maybe if it's for a medical reason, maybe it's for an unforeseen cost, you know, that did come through, you need to buy a new refrigerator, you need to buy a new car. It's money that you can very quickly get your hands on and not have to go um, and, you know, sell it in the market and, you know, it be a little bit more of an ardu arduous process. It's something that you have direct uh, access to. Um, you know, a couple of concepts around that as well um, is going to be in your savings account, although interest rates, yes, we are at low levels right now, but if you've been reading any of the news, you are starting to see we are moving into a new uh, regime, if you will, new paradigm of interest rates. So you're going to start to see those interest rates start to creep up. So really think about those savings accounts when you're, and if you're in the market, looking to open up a new savings account, check to see what kind of rates, you know, banks are um, are offering at the moment. Do your homework on that. You can, you're allowed to shop that around. It's not always, you know, um, it's not always the, um, the same at every single bank. So especially as we're moving into this new higher interest rate market, which is also coinciding with a rise in inflation, I would very much um, ask you to do a bit of homework and check on banks and what um, they're offering in terms of those different accounts that you could have access to. Now, you have savings on one side and then the other um, option too to do with your money outside of just spending it is going to be investing. So why would we invest? Investing, yes, it comes with more risk. You're putting it to work in markets. If you're buying bonds, if you're buying stocks, maybe you're buying physical assets. There's a lot of new alternative investments, right, that are happening right now in the market. I'm sure we're all familiar with the digital asset, you know, uh, phenomenon that we're experiencing right now. Um, there is more risk associated to putting your market, uh, to putting your money in those, um, in those products. 
but with more risk in theory, with higher risk, could lead to higher returns. So there is definitely a cost, um, there is a definitely, you know, an analysis that you need to do in terms of looking at your money, deciding if it's time to, if it's money that you need to put to save, and then money that you can actively look to invest. And I would say that for each individual person, those decisions might be slightly different, but I really do think a you know, a sound rule, uh, rule of thumb and something that I was taught. And I do think um, that we do try to, you know, want to make sure that comes through in, um, in this messaging is that you should really actively try to be building your savings to an amount that you are comfortable with for yourself or with, um, you know, for your family. Um, just something to fall back on in case things do get, uh, you know, in case you do come uh, upon a hardship, um, it's always good to be able to fall back, you know, on um, on uh, on those funds and have those as something um, that you can tap. Another rule of thumb, invest as much as you're willing to risk. This mm -hmm. is rule of thumb from trading to personal investment. Just, uh, just go in with as much as you're willing to risk. So keep that in mind when you're approaching saving versus investing for your methods of growing your cash, especially with the value of the dollar currently, the value of your cash currently in the current atmosphere of inflation. Yep, absolutely. And then I can't remember, Hada, if there was the comment that was here or if it's on the following slide, um, but there is on the 401k, on, um, mm -hmm. the, on the match. Them. I'll be going through them uh, a bit later, the Perfect. retirement funds, yep. Perfect. Um, so this, I think, is a really nice slide that much better articulates or more seamlessly articulates what I was trying to uh, to say on the previous slide in terms of what that thought process you should you know um, a, a, or a good a good way to present a thought process on um, you know and thinking about your money and determining between savings uh, or investing. Um, so this is the waterfall structure, you know, there, and there's a couple of different, you know, ways I'm, sh I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen this presented if you uh, have taken a financial literacy class before, or perhaps some of these terms are fun or are terms that you've heard just speaking with friends or speaking with family. You know, I really do wish that I had recalled, um, not recalled, of course I recalled, but just chose not to actively do it as much as I wish I had done, but my dad's concept of the emergency fund. And, you know, starting out as early as possible, creating that emergency fund. Now, an emergency fund doesn't mean okay, I'm automatically going to have, you know, $5,000 to be put, you know, put to the side and I don't need to touch that right now. Start small, you know, maybe from each paycheck, you're going to put, you know, if it's 2% or 3% of your paycheck, just if you're in a, if you have your savings account, every paycheck that comes through, just getting into the habit to move that over to your emergency fund. And maybe at the end of the month, if you've had a good month in terms of just being good on not eating out as actively, or maybe a month where you weren't traveling as much, if you do find yourself a little bit, you know, quote unquote, cash rich, using maybe some of that extra money to put into that emergency fund as well. And slowly but surely you're going to see that climb. And that's a good way just to kind of keep um, a governance and keeping yourself honest about being, you know, actively adding to that. Um, there's a couple of different, you know, uh, there's a couple of different ways to think about what your target amount should be in an emergency fund. It's going to be, you know, predicated on how many people you're thinking about, um, you know, what that emergency fund is also being put to use for. But what my personal one I like to think of is all of my costs. So if it's for my mortgage, if it's for my, um, you know, for healthcare, what are my family's costs? And then I uh, will times that by, uh, for like my monthly costs. And then my personal is, um, I like to times that by four. So in the chance where I would not have access or if I would not have income for four months, I tried to have an emergency fund that would be able to uh, cover all of those costs that I know I'm going to incur just because I'm, you know, just because I'm, you know, doing my everyday things and need to be able to pay my bills. 
Um, some individuals may only want that to be three months. I know people that like to have an emergency fund that's more like six months, um, more on the conservative side. But I would say, you know, think about your own personal situations, um, have that target amount for yourself and give that to, you know, maybe that can be a 2022 resolution that by the end of the year, you're going to have created that target emergency fund um, or at least, you know, have made some um, good, you know, good work in trying to get to that target. Um, the next step is the paying down high interest debt. So this is going to be if you are um, if you are familiar with credit cards, maybe you have a credit card yourself. If you are utilizing any credit um, that does have a high interest rate, I know coming out of college, myself and my husband, we definitely had student loans that needed to be paid off. We did have a few years where those interest rates were quite low, but then they still, and then at least our personal interest rates then did jump to another level. We did try to get ahead of paying off um, that debt much sooner than later. And sometimes paying off that debt could make, you know, th that might be better money put to use, you know, that extra two or $3,000 to paying off that debt so you don't incur those interest costs instead of putting that $2,000 into your emergency fund. So again, it's, you know, a thing, uh, you know, different things to consider, but would definitely say, um, you know, making sure you're cognizant of if you are incurring any interest, uh, interest currently, know what that amount is and see if there's any way for you to you know keep control and keep a strict governance around that moving forward as you're trying to create your credit profile just one thing I'll to this also it helps to know what's happening in the market in the world so also keep an eye if interest rates are going up or going down you can follow that by the central banks um, and this is helpful because you might be able to refinance your student loan at different rates so depending on the state of the, the interest rate situation, right? So that was just gonna caveat right there. Bring it back to you, Mel. Definitely, definitely. Um, and then savings goals. This again, you know, is, um, you know, outside of your targets that you'll have for your emergency fund, you may have goals that you are, um, that you're saving for. Maybe it's to buy a new car, to buy a new laptop, a new phone. Um, yes, you're allowed to spend money on buying a new, you know, a new pair of jeans or a new pair of shoes. That's definitely allowed. But, you know, having what, what are those medium uh, and short term goals that you have for yourself? Maybe it's to travel, right? You know, we're starting to see the increase in, you know, those flight costs are definitely starting to go up. So having, um, creating, uh, again, a little bit of structure around how you're going to save for those, instead of it just being, okay, yeah, this is the time I'm just going to use the money to do it. It's always, um, if you can get into the habit earlier than later of setting yourself up to start to plan ahead for those trips or for that purchase you're going to make is just a nice way, um, you know, to, uh, to be thinking about your finances and really taking ownership um, of your money. Um, and then last on the waterfall is going to be um, your choices for investing and then also paying down your low interest debt as well. Um, so again, this is just sort of a hierarchy that we would suggest in terms of thinking about what to be actively doing, you know, with your cash. There may be some adjustments given your own personal situations, but we do think that these are, um, this is a good way to be thinking, you know, about how um, you should be actively using any um, money that you do have outside of, you know, of course, paying your bills um, and, you know, buying food and, you know, get, uh, and you're paying for your shelter. Um, we did want to make a very important point too when it comes to savings is on your retirement plans. Um, and the first one that we introduce here is your 401k, which is, you know, um, if your employer may or may not, you know, provide this to you, but hopefully, you know, on your um, new uh, on your new joiner orientation, if there is a 401k plan that is provided by your company, this should be something that your HR has already actively spoken to you about, or perhaps there's you know, a third party um, benefits team that your employer uses. They're there for you. So if you have any questions, if you're sitting here and going, you know what, Mel, I don't know if we have Ooh, a 401k love. plan at my company, ask your HR. Ask your HR if, if you have one. And then the second um, important question to ask is, is do they offer a 401k matching policy? 
And what does that mean? Um, there are certain com uh, there are um, there are many companies, but um, that will actually match the uh, dollar for dollar up to a certain point, but a dollar for dollar, what um, you actually end up contributing to your 401k plan. And now each company is going to be very different in terms of how and if they do offer this type of um, this type of benefit, because this would come underneath, you know, your your benefits. Um, but it is an important question to ask your HR if this is not something, you know, that has um, that you've, you know, have come across um, in your uh, discussions when you were joining uh, your firm, or if you're looking to join, you know, if you're currently interviewing right now. These are all good questions to ask when you get on the phone with your HR representative, um, just to make sure you know what choices you have to maximize your cash for yourself. So, uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, absolutely, Mel. So on this note, I would like to speak a, a bit about the retirement and savings accounts out there. And for any further information, you can literally go to irs.gov and see under their retirement plans, what do they offer? offer was the tax structure for any of those. But to go back to 401k to simplify it, 401k, it's a corporate retirement, it's a corporate retirement plan. Uh, it's a divine, this also defined contribution plan, as Mel was saying. Um, there's a maximum amount that you can put a year. Um, there's also the IRAs, which you probably heard of. IRAs are individual retirement accounts. There's traditional, there's Roth, um, and you can think of these as in addition to other retirement accounts like 401k if you have it, but if you don't have it, it's, it's also out there for you to start it. Now, the difference is your 401k can be pre-tax money. So that's the tax advantage. Your, your IRAs and your Roth IRA particularly, and here I'm speaking about, would be after tax money. So after your taxes, contributions to 401k, your health benefits, yada, yada, yada. Now, let's say you have a sort of an amount. There's a maximum, I think, this year is up to $6,000 a year. Now you decide, well, I, I think I can spare $100 this month. I'm going to put it towards my Roth IRA, let's say, or another, another account, traditional IRA. Um, and so it has a threshold. It has an income threshold. And um, you can start a distribution, meaning receiving the money, starting to take it out after you're 59 and a half. That's kind of the usual age cutoff for most of these accounts. Um, and any distribution, taking the money earlier than, you sh than that age, 59.5, puts you subject to a penalty of 10%. Um, and outside the retirement IRA plans are also tax advantage savings plans for education. So Mel was talking about 529. There's a Coverdell and there's the section 529 plan. Both of these are considered kind of uh, for education savings for college, primary, uh, for high school and whatnot. So if you would like to learn more about that, there's a plenty of list in irs.gov. From my personal from my personal experience, and we will go through the platforms in a bit. Um, I personally have a an account, um, my retirement account set up with. Um, uh, I guess I can say the name, Melissa. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's, it's through what our employer yeah, is uh, exactly. has provided. My, my, exactly, it's not an advertisement whatsoever. Disclaimer, mm -hmm. but my personally, I have my account set up, my retirement accounts, and my brokerage accounts, and my savings account set up through Fidelity, and through that, I have multiple options. I can choose it. If you go to their website, you can. I, I personally, when I first started to learn about this, I wish I knew this when I graduated school. I kind of got thrown into it, start a credit card, start all these things early on, and I felt still, I still felt behind, even though here I am. You know, I'm in the industry. I'm a finance professional. Um, but in, within the website, you can see options. They even have a questionnaire. They can see your taste and your appetite for what's your risk appetite. What's your, what's your, what's your, you know, what's your, what's your mindset? Do you want to save for a house? Do you want to actually just for retirement? What age do you think you will retire? It has all of these things. And based on that, it will tailor it and it will give you uh, suggestion options. Um, so there's that. Additionally, you can pay for investment advice and you can pay for a financial advisor. So there are different methods about going through, through these, um, through the, through these uh, savings and, and retirement options and investment options. It's, um, I think what we're, help, we're trying to help with here is to tell you what they are, they exist, where do they exist? And you know, the journey starts from that. As you go through it, you'll keep on learning. So okay. I think, yeah. 
We think we're Since good. I think Mika just asked a question on what happens to your 401k when you change your jobs. So you have a couple of different options. One is you can keep your 401k at, you know, the plan provider and it will continue, you know, just to, to, um, to stay vested there. You can roll your 501k into an individual IRA, which uh, Jara was just, um, was just talking about there. And then there's also the option to, if your new employer offers, you know, an, um, a plan that maybe is lower cost or, you know, is something that's more advantageous in your opinion, you could then move that 401k and roll that into your new employer's plan as well. I, Eleanor, am I missing any other options there? Or if, if you, of course, could cash out too, but for in terms of taxes, I would suggest not to. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> so um, some of them won't give you the match if you leave too soon. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, that's something to be cognizant of. Well, your yeah. money is always your money. Mm -hmm. so you don't have to worry about the money you've put in. They'll, in some cases, it'll just get rebated to you if you leave too quickly. But okay. uh, many of them will withhold that match at some point. Um, there are rules on how long you have to be be there to be what's called vested in the, in the plan. Got it. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's definitely something to be cognizant of. And had I am sensitive to the time too, um, but I think this is just another a good slide for people to see in terms of um, savings accounts, um, just something I had mentioned earlier as well. So maybe it's a little early on it, um, but in terms of your traditional savings accounts and then also your certificate of deposits, um, which are going to give you a little bit of an, uh, you know, an extra boost when it comes to the interest rate. However, your money is locked up for a certain period of time. So again, back to that analysis, you know, for yourself and your personal situation in terms of how easily accessible you want those funds to be. Um, and then that will, you know, help determine for you which, you know, accounts that you should be considering for your needs. Okay, um, we can proceed to the next slides. Um, this is <laughs> to simplify it. This is math. We don't have to go through it, uh, but this is for you to review and go back to it. Simply, it's it's showing you the time value of your money. It's best to either save or invest and whatnot. So. Um, there's simple and there's compounded interest. Um, these are very, if you go through these, um, they're, Mel, do you want to say anything? Oh yeah, I was just going to say the, this, the numbers es essentially are, are just proving the point of starting early in terms of saving and uh, starting early in terms of investing. So, you know, having your money work, when we talk about that concept too, um, ha having your money work for you, you know, as you are, um, as you are um, putting money to work um, and you start to earn interest, then your your principal that you've put in plus your interest is then also continuing to work and then you're building more interest off of that new higher balance and so it just essentially trying to show that with minimal work of course it's a lot of work to set this up you know um and set up your governance around how you are investing but it does go a long way it is worth you know the the extra homework and making sure that you can get your money you know active um in terms of giving you more opportunities and having your money grow for you over um you know over your careers and over and as you get older um i think it's also important as Hada pointed out this new shift in um, where we are right now in terms of financial conditions so higher interest rates, higher inflation, you know, what a dollar is worth today is not going to be the same value that it is in five years. So you want to make sure that you're staying um, active, you know, and making sure that your cash um, has a chance, you know, to stay up with the current rate of inflation. Um, so we do hope that if there's anything we can leave you with today is to take a look at some of these opportunities. If you do have the capacity to start to put a bit of money to work from the investing side, or or at least consider some other um, savings um, options that might give you a bit more of a boost on your interest rate, given that we are really, you know, um, entering into a completely different environment for uh, for savings. Uh, Jenna, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> next slide, I believe. Yep. Uh, this is an exercise. You can try it at home, uh, but um, this is simply simplifying what Melissa. Um, and I have been discussing just to think of your savings goals and to to have a practice um, and and decide 
and adjust your contributions and hopefully you can achieve that uh, healthy um, balance. Um, we can go to the next. And I think one. someone just had a question on like where you can see it. This is a great link. I really do like this website, that bankrate.com on the simple savings calculator. I think it's just a nice little tool to use um, and to, to keep to keep um, oneself honest on uh, what you're trying to, to achieve with your uh -huh. savings. Uh, next slide. Uh, Mel, if you would like to kind of give the breakdown of uh, yes. how do you go about yes. your income, HIV? Now, this might look, you know, again, this might look quite simple in terms of nature. Like, it, you know, it, it just makes sense. But I think we all know that... Um, once you know the money hits the checking account, it's very hard for all of these rules, you know, to keep one uh, to keep oneself diligent around these rules. But if there's one thing, you know, that I was taught, um, you know, as a kid, and one thing I really am trying to impress upon my kids right now is this concept of paying yourself first. And what does that mean? That means taking that piece of your paycheck, whatever it might be, and putting that to the side and saying, this is, you know, this, this is for me. This is, you know, I'm going to treat myself maybe to a nice cup of coffee or whatever it is. Those are definitely important things. But you do really want to think about, um, uh, you know, looking at what you're, what do you spend money on? Um, and Hada and I were laughing when we were setting up and going through the slides and we were joking about, um, I mean, I do, I have a Excel spreadsheet and it sounds like Hada's are a lot more powerful than mine are, but I do, I will, I will look at what I spend money on, on a monthly basis. I've done, you know, I've done walkthroughs where I look at it on a weekly basis. Cause I'm like, wait a second, how did this money disappear? What am I spending it on? And then as you go through, you're like, oh, wait a second. I'm taking Uber way too much, or wait a second, I know I can get coffee for a cheaper rate. If you're noticing a theme, I drink a lot of coffee. Um, you know, there's, and so then you can start to adjust some of your choices to make those balances a little bit more. And then hopefully at the end of each of those months, you have a little bit of more money to either put into your savings or maybe, you know, to start to uh, put into investing, um, and then, you know, make your money and make your money work more for you too. But I do think that this is an important exercise. I would impress upon all of you if you've not done this before in terms of just looking at what your, um, you know, what your debits and what your credits are to your checking account. It's a simple exercise. You can probably do it in 30 minutes to an hour, but it's an, just a nice way to see what money's coming in what money's coming out, and if there is already from day one a bit of a lopsided, you know, to take a look at how you can make that a bit more balanced. Um, and then it might, you know, surprise you how much money you're spending on one particular thing. And it might be that, um, you know, aha moment for yourself where you can, you know, tweak a little thing, uh, tweak a little, um, uh, a little bit of your behaviors uh, in order, you know, to, uh, in order to make yourself more financially rich at the end of the month. Uh, next slide. Um, again, this is just summarizing what Mel was going through. Just to get one thing to keep in mind about your taxes, which is hopefully for the next season, I think this season we might have missed it, but hopefully for the next tax seasons, uh, we will be doing a similar financial literacy workshop around your taxes. But um, fun fact, not fun fact, you should keep in mind your tax refund can count as an income against your next year's um, tax returns. So just to keep that in mind, you know, just because you've got a couple of grants or a couple of hundreds, don't go all <laughs> above and aboard uh, with that money. So think smart about how you uh, use your money. Uh, Jenna, we can move to the next slide. Um, oh. Perfect. So now we go into examples of investing. Um, Melissa, uh, do you want to go through these instruments that can be used for investment, what they are? People hear about stocks, they hear about bonds, mutual funds, what is that? And what does the risk reward spectrum look like? What should people be keeping in mind with, especially there's an abundance of information out there that sometimes can be misleading or for, to people? 
Yeah, definitely. So I think the main takeaway from the slide I would just um, would like to highlight is going to be on the bottom, which is showing the risk profile for these different instruments. So, you know, we've got some fantastic definitions of, you know, what a bond is, what an ETF is, what the of what stocks are. And um, these may be, you know, concepts that you already are familiar with. And if you are just seeing them for the first time, I would definitely take read of these do a little bit of homework on yourself too. If it is, you know, if these are instruments that you are starting to consider uh, for yourself. Um, but I really think that the key um, takeaway from this slide is the let, you know, the kind of barometer, if you will, in terms of the risk profile and then also the potential profit. Um, and this ties, I think, nicely back into the comment that Hara was making earlier about when you are going to sit down and you're going, and, and if you are thinking about investing in markets, more often than not, when you're opening up any type of investment account, there's going to be some sort of survey. Either it's going to be a digital survey or if you're sitting down with an individual, a financial advisor, and they're going to ask you, you know, basic questions and to get a feel for what is your risk tolerance? What is your goal with this particular account? Is it a long-term investment goal? Is it short-term, medium-term? This is going to then help them. And then answering these questions too for yourself, this is going to help you um, get into a direction or at least you know create a plan of what type of instruments you should be investing in in order to achieve those goals. If you're just trying to make a lot of money in a really short period of time, you're not gonna be buying US government bonds. That would be the polar opposite of what you would need to be investing in. You would need to be investing in something that's going to have quite a high return very quickly. So let's think like Bitcoin or, you know, something probably that has a, you know, a bit more of a volatility factor to it too. But what comes with that higher, um, that higher return or that potential higher volatility is going to be a higher risk element. And what do I mean by a risk element? I mean, the potential that you could also lose your investment too. So it's not always going to be a positive return, right? There could be an opportunity there might be in a situation where, um, you know, jumping into an investment that has that high risk profile, um, that where you could actually be down the money that you um, that you ended up putting into the investment um, into the investment fund. But again, that's why it's so important to be 100% honest with yourself when you're answering those questions about what your risk tolerance is, um, and you know, and you know, the amount of money you know that you're putting into the account, um, because you know, with that higher risk, um, there is the potential you know that you're not going to be able to access it or have access to that in order to pay you know if you needed it for bills or whatnot. So that's why again, going back to where we started in this presentation, savings versus investing, and making sure you have that clear definition of what funds you're using for both of those, because um, they're two very, should be viewed as two very, very different aspects um, for uh, uh, your financial, uh, for your financial platform. The other thing to keep in mind is when you look at mutual funds and ETFs, exchange traded uh, funds, exchange traded funds are uh, think of a basket of companies, uh, I think Fortune 500 companies, right? Uh, trading on exchange. Um, mutual funds are different, different beasts. Um, and so looking into those and understanding what those are. ETFs, I think you can continuously buy them throughout the day, let's say intraday trading. It's being intraday traded versus mutual funds. Sometimes, um, not sometimes, it's actually you buy at a certain closing, closing price. Uh, the price is not always showing at the... Um, Excuse me. Apologies. You. One second. Hmm? I'll take over. I'll take over. Uh, you have some visitors. Uh, no worries. Absolutely. Sorry. Absolutely. No worries. Um, <laughs> so uh, we were back to that. So basically, what I'm saying is look into exactly what these baskets, what these funds, uh, what these ETFs are including, um, and and uh, and and also even into stocks, going to single stocks. Do you know if you will be monitoring your stock performance the whole time or not? Do you know if you are going to be passively managing your investments or not? Uh, do you think you have the time, the capacity, the maturity as well? We mm -hmm. often hear people trading options. Options are complex 
products, for instance, that are volatility products um, that are, you know, usually are being treated by sophisticated institutions, individuals. So before you put a foot into those doors, definitely make uh, have a under strong understanding of what you're looking into. Um, and I believe we can go to the next slides to see what platforms. Um, well, uh, these are kind of the understanding ETFs and mutual funds we were going through. Um, and again, how do you decide where you 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 invest? Like we said, there's, an, there's, a, there's a very low, if you have a very low risk, if you have a moderate risk, if you have a high risk, and you can see that what those categories, uh, which ones, what instrument falls into which under which category? Um, you have to understand your risk tolerance and, and your timeline for achieving your goals versus you want money to be growing in a certain timeline or actually you're trying to play around and understand you know what's going on out there and you're willing to risk that money. It depends. It's, it's nice to start off um, with teeny bits early on and then see how you feel from there onwards. Um, Mel, you have anything to add on to this? Or no, I, I, you did touch upon it. And just to, um, I would say, uh, you know, for myself too, I think, you know, as you're getting into, um, if you are starting to think about, you know, investing, um, I do think that mutual funds and ETFs are um, a nice way to start too, if you're thinking about getting into, you know, the stock market, because they do give you that broad based exposure. So you're not just, you know, stock picking, you know, there is a diversification that comes with that. So it does um, minimize your risk and gives you um, um, just some natural diversification there. So more exposure, if you will, to a broad based industry instead of just so if you said, oh, I hear tech, you know, is really where, you know, people are making a lot of money in technology right now. You know, it would be the difference between taking your $100 and putting it all on Apple on one stock to perform versus, you know, taking your $100 and divvying that up and buying a couple of different, you know, technology products. Um, uh, just again, to try to mitigate, you know, some of, uh, some of that risk. Simply don't put all your eggs in one basket, which is a topic we will touch upon in a bit. Um, as well. Can you move to the next slide? <clears throat> so these are the platforms, one of the platforms, again, this is not an advertisement. These are the most commonly used and most um, kind of platforms out there that have kind of friendly user interfaces uh, and from my personal experience. Um, so you can invest using your smartphone, uh, buying and selling investments. Uh, you can look into, I think, market colors also. Uh, I think some of them show you like charts and whatnot of your uh, of the stocks or of uh, whichever instrument you're looking into investing um and uh, and yeah so this is really just giving you an idea of what's out there uh, you can always uh, start from there and see what works for you uh we can go to the next slide um this is really summing up what Melissa was just talking about. The greater the potential profit, the greater the risk that you may lose money. So that's something you gotta keep, you know, you have to be honest with yourself. Um, and uh, yep, yeah, next slide. This is checking your understanding. I'm trusting we are all on board, <laughs> same page. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, Mel, do we have to cover this part? I mean, I, I was just going to say, I think that this is just something to, you know, as you're starting to go through um, and get, you know, and start to make some, you know, uh, decisions, you know, for yourself. Um, I think risk adjusted uh, returns are, um, you know, it's, you know, a good, a good concept to be aware of, but I don't know for this particular um, mm -hmm. uh, discussion, it's relevant to our conversation. Okay, um, next slide, Jenna. Uh, next slide, it's a lot of math. Next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide. <laughs> All right. This is, yeah, this I think is a nice way to end, yeah. Yeah, uh, Mel, you wanna take over? Yeah, so I mean, I think you, if you're, you know, there's a couple of common themes, right, that you've probably been hearing and a couple of, uh, couple of terms that have been quite repetitive, you know, through the past, uh, through the past hour. And I think that this is a nice one that sums it up in terms of, um, in terms of the, uh, the key idea being diversification and also to just having that honest conversation with yourself or with your family, with your friends, whoever, you know, you're making those financial decisions with about what your risk tolerance is and what, and 
and also to picking your risk tolerance in making sure that it fits into the context of where you are financially right now and where you are trying to be financially as well. So ensuring that again, step one, making sure that we have our emergency funds, that we have our savings, that we're able to cover our day-to-day -day costs. Then two, taking money aside that we can then actively start investing. If we're saving correctly, if we're having you know a really sound business plan, if you will, to how we are um, uh, covering all of our costs on the day-to-day, -day, hopefully that amount of money starts to grow in terms of what we can start to invest. And then this slide kind of introduces how we can be thinking about um, how we how we should be thinking about where our money is actually working and where are we as individuals what we are invested in so this you know i know it might sound a little bit odd to think of yourself as a portfolio manager right or an you know or a investment professional but as you're taking these steps and really owning your money and um, trying to put some money to work for yourself in order to grow, you are. You are your own personal portfolio manager, your savings accounts, your checking accounts, you know, your 529s for, you know, for uh, your kids. Those are all underneath your, um, underneath your purview. And it's up to you to make sure that you're maximizing those. Um, so this is just a way to introduce you know, ideas about how um, how you can be thinking about where you are, where you have exposure to. So if you have a portfolio that is perfectly balanced between stocks and bonds, you know, 50%, 50%, you'd say that's quite balanced. If you're 100% in bonds, that would be considered a much more conservative portfolio. So lower returns, but less risk. And then if you are 100% in equities, that would be associated with more of an aggressive portfolio. So that would be high risk, but with the potential for higher returns. And, you know, again, back to um, the example that Hado mentioned before with when you're setting up some of these investment accounts, answering those questions, you know, with 100% transparent, uh, transparency and 100% honesty is going to make you each year, you should be reviewing what your financial goals are and where you are financially for yourself, because you might dynamically need to adjust some of your asset allocation because of changes in your personal situation. Um, in the, when you're first starting out, you're probably going to get some recommendations in terms of, well, based upon your age, we would say that you should be, you know, more aggressive if on if you're, you know, on the younger side. And that's going to that's going to go hand in hand, assuming that your investments are for the longer term. So you have more time to take some risks right now. You right, you have a bit of that buffer. Um, you don't need to be thinking about retirement in the next, you know, five years. So you don't need to be thinking and being conservative, right? And trying to ensure that your money is staying stable. You have a bit of um, you are able to have a higher risk tolerance. Um, but, you know, for some people like myself starting out, um, I knew I had very minimal risk tolerance. That probably explains why I'm not in trading. Um, but so I started out, I've always been 50-50 and really I've just kind of stayed the course for, uh, for quite a while. Um, and I think, you know, but I think what's important, you know, too, to take away from this is, um, you, just because you, when you set up your account that first time and you decide to go more aggressive and maybe you're going to be 70% in stocks and 30% um, in bonds, maybe, you know, you're going to introduce a house to that concept. It's going to change each year. Doesn't mean that you're stuck with that, you know, for the predetermined amount of times that individuals, you know, are suggesting. You can be dynamic about it um, and you do always have that option, you know, to, to, uh, to adjust and um, I think it's just something to be cognizant of and to be thinking about, um, you know, each year that should be just part of your, you know, your new year's to do is to review, you know, what your portfolio looks like, even if it doesn't include investment portfolios, your portfolio might be your cash, your sit, you know, your savings, um, maybe if you have a child, any of their, any of their accounts, um, maybe some physical assets that you have, but or it could just be your checking and it could just be your savings. That could just be your portfolio for right now. And that's and that's great. Um, that's a lot more than most people could, you know, that a lot of people could say. But then thinking about, OK, what's my goal then by the end of the year? Do you want to add another maybe diversification you know, factor to that portfolio? Um, 
So again, just little suggestions that we're trying to give to you to be thinking a little bit outside of the box um, on your finances um, and hopefully just making okay. your money work for you. Yeah. And again, just to remember what a bond and a stock is and why one is considered conservative, the other one can be considered aggressive. A bond, you're buying the, a company's debt, or if you are, let's say, buying U.S. government treasuries or securities, you are buying the U.S. government's debt. Um, and so you are, you put in a principal and you get an interest rate on it and you get paid out based on that. So worst case scenario, you are getting your principles back. For a stock, you are buying an equity in the company. So it's it's quite different. The principal you put in, $100 that you can put in, tomorrow could be a 50, another day could be $200. So that's something why we consider one on a more conservative spectrum and the other one on the more aggressive perspective when it comes to risk tolerance. And again, don't put all your eggs in the same basket. Um, and, um, and yeah, on that note, um, I guess we can see what other slides we have, but I believe we're approaching um, the end of it, unless uh, this is an exercise, I guess, for investing in stocks. Um, uh, home ownership, I think, uh, unless you are buying a home, I think it'll be interesting. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's a good place to end. Yeah, it's on the asset allocation, and maybe we can open it up just for a few questions before we close it out. Absolutely. And I think we do have a question right here and it comes from Haifa and she's asking, what are the best places to keep or store an emergency fund? My suggestion um, is going to be just, you know, to, within your bank, you know, that you have quick access to. So just your traditional savings account would be my suggestion. Um, Hada and Eleanor, I don't know if you have any other, um, any other suggestions there, but again, I think the key concept being easily, easily acceptable, uh, accessible, um, and, and easy to liquidate. So I think for me personally, it's a, it it's very important for me to see how quickly can I get the money out. Um, so you can choose, you can go and do your research to see which um, which banks or which platforms um, offer you uh, access to liquidity immediately within 24 hours, within two hours, uh, within two days, meaning that you are able to transfer that money into your, let's say, checking account, into your debit, where you can take it out even as a cash as quickly as you need. So depending on that, that's how you go about doing your research. So for me personally, I diversify not just my assets, but also the platforms where I have my money at. Um, so it could be from, um, and again, understanding that some of it is it being saved in, in a, with a locked up period, um, or simply um, my bank account, um, my another savings account, um, and it's really, there are, there are particular savings accounts that you can look into the offer, I think, where I'm now maybe 0.4 or 0.5% of interest rate. Um, so there are ways to go about it. I think for you, you need to, to put in your money in um, the, the best one that will give you immediate access. And I think that's why your immediate bank account, the savings account, the traditional one is usually the recommended for emergency fund. Um, any other uh, questions or Eleanor, if you wanted to develop on that? No, I would I was going to say exactly what you just said, which is that I tend to have like what I consider real emergency funds that are in just my my general savings account. And then I tend to have a CD for what I consider to be emergency funds that I won't need. You know, it's a longer term emergency. Mm. If I'm still in CD, CD if, being certificate of deposit, which is in the slides as well. <laughs> right. And I will do that. It earns slightly more money and I can um, I can still access it. And if necessary, I can take a hit on it and, and access it really quickly. But in general, I use that um, just as a as a way to earn more interest. And if I'm still like if I was unemployed for over six months because the job market was awful, I wouldn't lose my home. Yeah. So that okay. kind of money. Um, next question was, how do you recommend choosing investments during inflation or recession? Um, I think this is a... Sorry, Mel, just one disclaimer. We do not recommend. We simply outplay the facts. 
uh, that yes. are out here. Yeah, so I was. Yeah, I was just gonna. Community. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Like, I do think that on some of these platforms, I'm sure that there is some great research that is out there in terms to show how performances have been. You know, how um, commodities might have performed in inflationary times, or you know, gold. You know, during um, you know during recession. Um, so definitely utilize some of those platforms, and there is a lot of research that is um, easily accessible um, on that. And then if you are opening up any retirement accounts or you already have one open, there should be, you know, um, opportunities to discuss, you know, with um, the professionals, you know, that are looking over the portfolios to ask um, some of those questions. Um. We still have- Sorry, can I just, I'm sorry, this is Anna. Can I just clarify real quick? I was wondering, or how how should we even get in that to approach? I mean, don't you? I'm not trying to look for how necessarily, but I guess how, like how should we even be thinking about it? When, when people are throwing out the words like um, inflation, impending recession, all of this, should we be, the, sometimes it causes fear. <laughs> So should it just be something where we just like let it ride out? Um, and I know, and I will also do my research, but I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on how to even get in the right headspace about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think also too, I know I said it a couple of times, but I think it's, um, I don't think it's anything to be fearful about right now. Um, I just think it's important to be cognizant of the fact that we are, you know, we've emerged, you know, from a low interest rate environment right now. So we're going to see some changes in terms of what, um, what are the types of investments that are out there for people and we're and we and actually we're told, we're kind of through into that trend right now too like the digital asset side you know is something that when i started out with investing those were not opportunities you know that i was even thinking about when i was leaving school that you know that was not digital currencies were were not anything that existed so i think that it's not anything to be fearful of i think it's just um I think it's just something that when you are sitting down and um, and talking with any financial advisors or thinking about starting to invest, um, you know, just wanting to read up on what are some of those market trends and some suggestions, and that's why I really would um, uh, would stress upon, uh, you know, if markets are not something that you are active in, and this is myself included, I'm in foreign exchange. I don't know anything about the stock market. Like if you asked me like, what's your like number one stock pick? I'd be like, what are you talking about? I, <laughs> I have no idea. I like, that's like a whole nother, a whole nother world. And so, you know, through, you know, and it wasn't the first time I opened up my investment account, but that's why I started, you know, in more broad based kind of indexes. So I could have more of a diversification in terms of my exposure. Um, and I think, for anyone that is just starting out, that's a good way to think about it. Like not thinking just single bonds or single stocks, but getting more what what exposure you would like to have from an industry perspective. And I think a, there's a lot of research out there for these uh, two you know terms that you highlight: inflation and recession. That you know, um, and a lot of research that shows how certain industries have performed. Um, you know, in in times of that, that you could um, that you could take, and are quite dig uh, quite digestible. I, I can definitely say exactly. And and it's simple. What we were trying to do today is to kind of show the tools and these instruments and these words and terminologies that you hear all over, and show you how to go about researching them, so that if you are interested into, you know what. I think I, I'm personally also same as Mel. I like broad. I'm because I'm a trader during during my job. I'm not able, and I don't even have compliance capacity to be day trading. Yeah. That's number one. And so because of that, I have certain um, regulatory restrictions on what I can trade, and. Because of that, I know I'm not going to be day to day looking at my 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 accounts every time. Although yes, I do look at the charts of the stuff I'm invested in at work sometimes, but um, at work. But it's it's really a matter of what are you? What's your time? What's your capacity? So I remember going through this solo in the in the past where I would just like literally Google like, 
okay, what are the, you know, best performing XYZ um, ETFs and, you know, in the, in the past year or whatnot. And I would read and there would be like a, a plethora of these like resources and I would start to read those um, and see which one I'm actually more comfortable of the more I know about it. And I started a bit by bit personally, like I started bit by bit putting here and there, seeing the performance. And then when you do sign up for these platforms, they will also show you historical performance. They will show you many statistics that are helpful for you to account for. Um, then you can always, you know, Google or see it. Um, another thing that these platforms, when we've had the recent volatile events, let's say, of the current um, conflict and war ongoing um, in, in, in Ukraine, we um, even some platforms would, would send like emails to their consumers and be like, what does this mean for you? Sign up here if you want to learn X, Y, Z. Sign up here if you have any questions. So the, the, these platforms are literally made for that one particular purpose, which is to make this, I guess, this journey and this process easier for you um, and to make it more accessible for the um, average person who is not as well-versed into this word, uh, world. And as Mel said, we are on foreign exchange. Like we might know what's happening with interest rates and the macros and, and, and the world um, central banks and whatnot, but. If you ask me about Facebook and Apple, I'm going to be like, um, uh, I don't know. How do they do? Let me look it up. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so exactly. it's not, um, yeah. I don't know if that was helpful, um, Anna, but um, but yeah. Cool. Well, I'm cognizant of the time. So I really do just appreciate everyone's time and ability, you know, to connect with us. And hopefully we've left you with some good takeaways and maybe some, you know, just personal, you know, things uh, to do for yourself when you're thinking about financial literacy. Um, the content is here for you. And yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any further questions. We'd love to keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you so much to, to Mel and Dada for, for taking us through all of those really um, helpful tips. Uh, I know it was helpful for me. <laughs> Hopefully it was helpful for everyone else as well. Um, we'll send out the slides uh, tomorrow or the next day to everyone who is here. Um, and thank you so much again. Uh, have a great rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.